Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I just want to take a moment to celebrate your Christian life with you. Jesus Christ reached down in the darkness and pulled you out of the mire, pulled you and saved you from yourself, for you were on a road bent toward hell. And Jesus offered you and me new life, and in surrendering to him, we have now become the children of God. And friends, that is a reason to praise and celebrate and lift your hands and, and sing with joy from your hearts because you have been saved by the blood of Jesus and you now are a victor in Christ, our Messiah. You see, the Bible tells us that the word of God is like water and it cleanses us. And when we go to the word of God, it's like taking a bath. We're being cleansed from all the things that the world has applied to us that we live in. And we become cleansed through the Holy Spirit and reminded of what it is that God wants us to do as followers of his son, Jesus. And so I hope and trust that you have been in the word of God, that you start every day with the word of God. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you for being with us again here at Be Ye Holy Ministries. Because out of the thousands, tens of thousands, millions of videos you could be watching right now, you have come to learn what it means to be a follower in the Lord Jesus Christ and how to apply his word to your life. And I am truly thankful from the bottom of my heart that you have decided to spend a few moments with us today. Well, I want to tell you that today is October the 12th, 2018. And the reason that I wanted to point that date out to you is because you may be watching this sometime after, and it would be important to go back and look at this time in history to reflect on what is taking place specifically in America so that you could better follow along in this discussion. Now, this is a continuation of what the Bible says about the series that we've just begun. And before we jump into today's topic, I have done everything in my power to steer clear from the politics of America. And the main reason for that is because we as the people of God are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And so we really shouldn't be that involved in what's taking place here. But what's taking place right now is only a image of what is to come and we need to know how to prepare ourselves as the followers of Jesus in how we are to relate to the things that are taking place now in this world and the things that are coming here in America. And the reason I say that is because I don't want to talk about Democrats. I don't want to talk about Republicans, but I do want to talk about the left and the right. And when I say the left and the right, I'm talking about those who do not belong to God and are doing everything they can to rebel against his will and his way. And on the right, those who do belong to God and they are doing everything in their power to obey God, to surrender to his will and to surrender to his way. And if you've just briefly been involved in the news and what is taking place in America, you see a clear divide between the left and the right. And I have to be honest with you, friends, as a man of this earth, embodied in this flesh, I wrestle with the same things that you wrestle with. Because when I see these newscasts on the evening news, and I see how the left is reacting to the things that we hold so dear as the people of God, I see that they are clearly driven by hate. And this causes an animosity in me. It causes a hostility within me. But as a follower of the Lord Jesus, I have to push that down. I have to imprison those feelings and not allow them to consume me and take control of me. 
But instead, as Jesus said, I need to bless those who curse me. I need to pray for those, and you need to pray for those who wish you harm. We don't need to take up arms against them and fight against them. We need to be lights in this world and reflect the spirit, the love of Jesus in our lives as we lay down our lives for them, just as he laid down his life for us. And I say all of that today simply because it's so easy for us to become critical, or another word for critical, judgmental. And so I want to talk to you today about what the Bible says about judging. And in order to do that, you must have your Bible in front of you. So grab your Bible, and if you would, open to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Well, actually, before we go to Philippians, let's go to Luke chapter 9, and I want to begin in verse 49. Now, I want us to look at this together. John, Jesus' most beloved disciple, says unto Jesus our master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. And we forbade him because he followeth not with us. So John sees one, someone who is working on behalf of Christ, who is proclaiming the name of Jesus, and yet he is not a follower among Jesus's closest few. And yet Jesus says unto him, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. So the master here basically says, John, don't worry about what they're doing. As long as they're proclaiming my name, that's what's most important. The Holy Spirit will take them from that place and instill truth within them. But they must hear my name. The seed must be planted in order for them to become a follower of mine. Now, Paul reflects this same attitude in Philippians and chapter 1. So if you go to Philippians chapter 1 and beginning, let's, let's just begin at verse 16. It says, there are some who preach Christ of contention. Now this means self-promotion. So they're preaching Jesus, but they're doing it with the wrong motive because they're, they're, they're trying to promote themselves. They want to be in the light as Paul is in the light. And so he says, they, they preach Christ of contention, not sincerely. But there are others in verse 17 who are proclaiming the name of Jesus with right motives from a motive of love. But now look at what Paul says in verse 18. He says, so what then between the two? How do I see each of them? He says, whether in pretense or for show or in truth, Christ is preached. And because of this, I do rejoice and will continue to rejoice. Now, basically, Paul is saying, look, there's some that's preaching Christ with false motives, and there are others who are preaching Christ with pure motives. But regardless, Christ is being preached. Now, there's been videos in the past where I have discussed the false teachings that are coming from some of the false preachers those who are preaching Christ with impure motives, specifically televangelists. And I hope, let me repeat that, I hope that I have been careful not to place shame or judgmentalism upon the person themselves, but that I have been careful to only expose the false teaching that they're involved in. Because when we place ourselves in the seat of judgment, and we begin to speak negatively about them, we are standing outside the teaching of Scripture. Because notice what Paul says here. Paul says there are some, look at verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. But do you notice something missing there? Paul doesn't say who these people are. He doesn't point out the individual. Now, I know, like I said, there are videos where I have named the individual. And as far as I can see from Scripture, I was wrong in doing so. And so I want to take this moment to simply apologize and to, to tell you that before Jesus, I will do my best not to name the individuals, only to name the false teaching itself. 
And then you should be able to discover, if you understand the false teaching, who it is that is proclaiming that false teaching. But Paul doesn't name them, nor did John name them in the example I gave you in Luke chapter 9, verse 49 and verse 50. And so in speaking of judgmentalism, as we look out at the world, there's a lot of judgment that we could place upon those in this world. Those who are absolutely lost and do not know Christ and who are attacking his name, his character, his word in every way they possibly can. Those who claim to know Jesus and yet propagate false teaching. Those who claim to know Jesus and yet continually live sinful lives. And yet, according to the Bible, there is only one group that we should be speaking to in a judgmental way, that we should be looking upon their lives, recognizing where they are falling short and help them to become better followers of the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, that you'll know that in um, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, we are told to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And Paul has just described here who he's speaking of in verse nine, when he says, you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore walk as children of light. So don't walk in the old darkness that you were delivered from, flee from those things. And anyone who takes on the name of Jesus and continues to walk in that darkness we need to be quick to point those things out so that we can save them from judgment and help them be better followers of the Lord Jesus. But Paul goes on by saying, don't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't spend your time with these people, but rather reprove them, strongly correct them, aiding them in becoming more faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And if they're truly his children, if they're truly his brothers and sisters, then they're going to heed those warnings because they want to do everything in their power to be the best for God that they can possibly be. That's why we see in Matthew chapter 18, if you want to turn there for a moment, Jesus says in verse 15, if your brother will trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault, point it out. You, you recognize it, you've seen it, you're judging it. So point it out to him and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not hear you, if he does not heed your warning, that's a red flag because that shows that he's not a follower of the Lord Jesus. Rebellion has set in rather than surrender. And so Jesus says, take one or two more so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word you speak may be established as truth. But if he neglects to heed what you're telling him, if he neglects to surrender and ask forgiveness, take it before the church. That's the second red flag that he's not a follower. Rebellion has set in, which is the opposite of surrender. And a follower of the Lord Jesus is compelled to surrender, not to rebel. Well, once you take it before the church, if he still continues to not heed what it is you're warning him about, let him be treated as a heathen man and a publican because he's shown by his rebellion, he is not a follower of the Lord Jesus. And so it's important that we understand that because what, what we're going to read next is critically important among the body of Christ because we're all striving to do what we can to be the best followers of his that we can be. But sometimes we slip. Sometimes we're, we make a mistake. Sometimes we may wander off the path and we need other brothers and sisters to warn us and guide us back to the narrow way. And so when Jesus tells us in John chapter seven, verse 24, judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment. You see, there is a place for judgment, but that judgment must be righteous judgment. It must come from a pure place with pure motives, with the desire to see everyone around us who claims the name of Jesus to be the best follower that they can be. And that's what Paul reminds us of 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 11. Now he says, I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. So here's a person who claims to know Jesus, but they're living a life of fornication. They're living a life of sexual sin. Or they're covetous. They're not content with what God has given them, but they desire more always. Or they're an idolater. Jesus isn't the Lord of their life. He's simply Lord. And there's other things that they give their time, their attention, their money, their praise, and their worship to, and this makes them an idolater. Or a railer. A railer is a, a, a fighter, someone who can't control their anger. Or a drunkard. And here he's speaking of someone who loses their mind due to the fact of alcohol consumption. Or an extortioner, someone taking advantage of someone else, someone cheating someone else. If any of those you know claim to be followers of the Lord Jesus and they fall into one of these categories, don't even sit and eat with this person. Now, Paul recognizes right here, someone may say, yeah, but doesn't that make me judgmental over them? And so Paul's going to answer that in verse 12. He says, what have I to do to judge them that are without. We're not judging sinners. We judge those who were within the family of God. We recognize, we call out the sin to those who claim to be followers of Jesus and are misrepresenting his name, his character, and his person by the ungodly lifestyle that they're living. And that's our duty as followers of the Lord Jesus, to call others out when they're wrong. If I were to ask you who is the most significant person in the New Testament, you would no doubtedly say Jesus, and that's a good answer. But who is the second most significant person? Well, again, you would most undoubtedly say Paul. Well, look at what happens to Paul in the book of Acts. I'm sorry, the book of Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. Now it says, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. So Paul is saying, I held him accountable. I called out his sin. And Paul, although he's very important in the New Testament, this is Peter, one of the closest followers of the Lord Jesus. And yet Paul takes no intimidation or no shame in calling out Peter because he was to be blamed. He was wrong for what he was doing. You see, before the Jewish leaders would make their way from James to Peter, Peter would eat with the Gentiles in the absence of the Jewish leaders. But once the Jewish leaders were coming to Peter, Peter would withdraw and separate himself from the Gentiles because he feared the Jewish leaders. And so seeing what Peter was doing, other Jews in verse 13 did the same as Peter was doing. Even Barnabas himself, one of Paul's closest friends, closest followers, followed along with what Peter was doing. But when I, Paul, in verse 14, saw that they did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, to love everyone as you love yourself, then I said to Peter, before all the followers of Jesus, before all the disciples, before all the Jewish leaders, if you, Peter, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, then why compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? So Paul recognizes that Peter is being partial. He's showing favoritism and he's even being hypocritical. And so Paul doesn't hesitate to call this sin out to Peter. And so Peter does what any Christian would do. Peter heeds the warning from Paul. He asks for forgiveness and he stops living with such hypocrisy, with showing such partiality. And so our focus in speaking of judgmentalism is that we are to help other Christians, true followers of the Lord Jesus, recognize where they are falling short so that they can become better followers of Jesus. And in turn, we need to be humble 
and accept when they point out our shortcomings unto us. But it must always be the word of God that is speaking and not simply the person's opinion. So if someone points out something to us that they feel is wrong as a follower of Jesus, then we need to be open to sit down with them and say, well, show me in the word of God where what I am doing is wrong. And if that's what the Bible says, then I'll surely conform myself to it. And so what we see today through the scripture is that we are to judge, but we're not to judge by appearance. We're to judge impartially, without hypocrisy, with pure motive and judging righteously. And we're not to judge, cast judgment on any who are outside the true body of Christ, only those who are within the body of Christ, just as if on our body we noticed that there was a scratch or a wound we did not realize there, but now we see it, we're going to put ointment on it and a bandage on it. And that's what we're doing when we, when we assist others in being loyal followers of the Lord Jesus. And as I said, that's what we should be looking for others to do for us, to point out our sin, to point out our shortcomings, so that we show to the world around us that we don't surrender to the flesh. We're not a slave of this world or the flesh, but we're a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. For as he said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Meaning, if you don't obey my commandments, you've shown by your actions you do not love me. And so let us examine ourselves very carefully when we place judgment on a political party, when we place judgment on a group of people, when we place judgment on an elected official, when we place judgment on anyone at any time, let us be very careful to examine our motives, to make sure that we are speaking from a place of purity, with pure motives, not deceiving ourselves or even being deceived by the enemy, speaking words of malice, hate, anger, hostility, envy, or spite. Do you remember what it says in Ephesians? I believe it's chapter 4 and verse 29. It says, Do not let any corrupt, worthless, impure, degrading communication proceed out of your mouth at any time. Do not let these words proceed out of your mouth, but only speak that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Speaking negatively about any specific person at any time does not bring grace unto the hearers. And when we speak in such a way in verse 30, we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Now, as I stated at the beginning of the video, the reason that I felt compelled to bring this word to you today is because I understand the hostility that can build within us when we see what's taking place in the world. Me living in America, specifically here in America. We can hear the hate and the violence coming from the left. We can see the hypocrisy coming from the left. We can see that the things they are saying wrong today, 10 years ago, was right in their definition, was right in their opinion. The evil, the hypocrisy, the hate is so evident, and it's easy for us to become hostile against it. But let me remind you what Jesus said, and let me end with these words. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who wish you harm. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is how you will be my lights in a dark and evil world. It's not always the easiest thing to do, friend. Forgiveness, compassion, and mercy can be hard to exercise at times. But this is the command of our Lord. And if we're soaking ourselves in his word, if we're being illuminated by his spirit, filled by his spirit, this is what should come out of us naturally. And so let us begin to discipline ourselves as followers of the Lord Jesus 
in the way that we see the world around us from the hidden places of our heart, in the way that we speak about them, and in the way that we act around them and toward them. Let us be lights in this world, true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. How do we fight hate? With love. How do we fight persecution? With forgiveness. How do we fight animosity? With tenderness, compassion, and kindness. So as we come to a close today, friends, I want to encourage you to begin to ask the Lord Jesus to let his spirit become your spirit so that you no longer walk after the flesh, but you walk in his spirit all the moments and all the days of your lives. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful again that you're with us. I pray that your life is being changed day by day by the word of God, that you're reading the word of God and you're heeding the word of God. You're conforming your life to the word of God and you're becoming the follower of Jesus that he has called you and chosen you to be. Now, as he wills and until next time, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.